Just if we could film him. He's not filming you, okay? <laughs> so if, if you don't, if you don't want to be in the line of shot, I'll sit there. But it looks like <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> it's not going on. Why is not? You know, we're not selling it. Or he just well, says, I've never, I've never filmed myself doing one of the speeches. <laughs> So we have Srini in this crowd, and likes to be called Srini? Srini? I haven't said it right yet, have I? No, you got it right. I, I said it two different ways, one of them got it right. Um, the art of being unmistakable, about 30 to 40 minutes, some question and answer time, and then we move on to our other thing, okay? Have a great day, thanks for all being here. And again, turn it off for Thank you so much for having me here. As John said, one of the things that I've been wanting to do ever since I started doing this work uh, is to speak to educators because I, I jokingly say this whole journey is the result of that I'm a failed byproduct of the education system. Uh, so, you know, I think that you know, what you guys do is really, really important. Uh, and I, you know, even when I look back at my own life, the people who shaped and influenced me the most were teachers, and I feel that teachers really have an ability to shape the future in a way that few people do. And yet, I look at where we're headed, and I'm really concerned about the future. And so what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about my story, uh, and you know, what led to this book, and where else it's led, and, and what has happened in my life as a byproduct of uh, the way I was brought up. You know, I was brought up in a culture of expectations, as most Indian people are. Uh, you know, if you're not an overachiever, you're likely to be disowned or given up for adoption. Uh, you know, it was expected that I would get straight A's. Nobody put our report cards on the fridge when we brought home the It was like, why isn't this an A? It was expected that I would go to college, so I got into Berkeley, which was the best school I went to, and I ended up going there. It was expected that I would go to grad school. It was also expected that I would go and get uh, a normal, respectable job. And even when I got to college, because I had the weight of all these expectations on me, I had a very limited view of what was possible with my life and my career. And I very distinctly remember the first week of school, having sort of delusions of grandeur about how I was gonna be an English major and, and do all this really interesting work, and I walk into a career fair, and a recruiter was there from what was then uh, Anderson Consulting and now Accenture, and I asked him what kinds of people they hire, and he said, we don't hire English majors. And that fundamentally changed my entire college experience. Every single decision I made from that point forward I made based on what I thought would get me a job, what I thought would get me a paycheck. <coughs> and, you know, I, I tried computer science, which I showed no aptitude for. Uh, I ended up with an economics degree, which was really just a means to an end, only because I thought all these things would get me a job. And I got a series of jobs over the next probably 10 years, all of which I eventually got fired from. Uh, which, if you've read the book, you know the story. Uh, I am definitely not somebody who, who does well in environments and has serious issues with authority, uh, which I guess is ironic since the you know, principal brought me here. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the really interesting lesson from all of that to me was that I was given such a limited sort of spectrum of what was possible. And it was like saying, hey, go out and turn your life into the masterpiece it's capable of being of, but you can only paint with these few colors. You know, I look at career paths and I remember thinking, so I can become a doctor, I can become an engineer, I can become a lawyer, or I can go become a business person. And of course, eventually that needs to be followed by graduate school. And I even remember my dad having a conversation with one of our relatives recently asking him about his son. He said, so what is he interested in? Does he want to be a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer? And I'm thinking, wait a minute, you've effectively limited all of his options and the kid is 14 years old, and there's so many other things that he could have 
been doing with his life. And nobody ever showed that to me. And so I went to graduate school, as I was expected to do. Uh, I got an MBA. And even throughout the time I was there, I never thought I was going to do what I've ended up doing now. And in between my first and second year of business school, I had one of my very last corporate jobs where I worked as a social media strategy intern for uh, a company called Intuit. They make a piece of software called TurboTax. And I didn't get a job offer at the end of the summer. And then I graduated in April 2009 into what economists call the worst economic recession in history. And everything that I thought I was supposed to do, and everything that I thought I would work, and everything that I had been taught to do up until that point didn't work at all. I was 30 years old, buried in debt, and had no serious job prospects. And I had basically done what the system said I should do. And before I tell you about what happened from there, I want to tell you about another story uh, about somebody who had a very similar upbringing my younger sister, just like me, brought up in a culture of expectations, straight A's, ended up going to Berkeley. She was pre-med. She graduated with a 3.7. She didn't get into med school on her first attempt, but she went and got a master's in anatomy. She got a 3.9 in the master's program and absolutely just killed it in med school. And today she's an anesthesiology resident at Yale. And the question that came up for me over and over again is, how could you have two people with such identical upbringings, and yet the results were so drastically different? John. You know, they're both straight and narrow paths, and yet they led to such different destinations. And I'm very convinced at this point that straight and narrow paths not only lead us to different destinations, that they're not so straight and narrow, they don't lead to very interesting destinations. John? <laughs> and this may be the biggest conclusion that I drew uh, after everything that had happened, is that my education was a one-size-fits-all solution. It didn't account for the fact that my sister and I have very different talents, we're incredibly different people, and yet I was force-fed the same criteria and curriculum, and people were stunned that the result was so different. So, you know, where the journey goes from here, I mean, some of you have read my book, right? Okay. So, I graduated in April 2009 with no idea what to do, how I was going to you know, make a career out of all of this. Here I was with an advanced degree, an undergraduate degree, 10 years of work experience. And the economy had fundamentally changed. And the degree in and of itself was no longer valuable. All people cared was that you had done things, you had created things, and you had made things. So I went to my dad, and I asked him if uh, I could borrow $500 to join this online blogging course, which was crazy because at that point I had a reputation for harebrained schemes that never worked. Uh, and my dad had funded many of them over the years. But before I did that, I actually had seen some things that very young people were doing online with social media to find jobs. And this girl had started a website called twittershouldhireme.com that ended up getting all sorts of national media attention, ended up getting her a job offer from Twitter. Uh, and multiple job offers, so many in fact, that she actually ended up not having to get a job and ended up starting her own company. And I think that you know, the first thing that many people do when they look at something like that, especially one of these Cinderella stories on the internet, you think, well, I can totally do that. So I started this simple little website called 100 Reasons You Should Hire Me.com. And for about three weeks I worked on it. I got hate mail from strangers on the internet, uh, you know, people from around the world told me it was the stupidest idea ever. And then I ran into the biggest hurdle of all. I couldn't come up with 100 reasons why anybody should hire me. <laughs> so 
I knew that I had a real problem. I said, okay, you know what, with all these degrees, all this education, I can't even come up with 100 reasons somebody should hire me. So I went to my dad and I borrowed some money to join this online course. And I started a blog, which I had no idea what any of this would lead, thinking that, okay, the only purpose of doing this is that it's gonna help me to get a day job. And it kind of has taken on a life of its own in a way that I never expected it would. Um, I did end up getting a day job where I was the content strategist for an online travel company where I did a lot of writing, I ran all of their social media, and like all my other jobs eventually, I was let go. And I think that was kind of the final straw that made me say, all right, I am not meant to do this. There, there's really no way that this is gonna work. And so I spent from about 2011 till last year when the Art of Being Unmistakable came out, really, strangely, you know, between the age of 30 and 36, trying to find what it is that I'm supposed to do with my life, trying to figure out what it is that I was gonna do with my career. Uh, when I got let go from that job, somehow I convinced my boss, who had reduced my hours to 10 hours a week, to let me do the job from Costa Rica, uh, which he bought into. And so I spent six months living there, surfing every day. If you've read the book, you know that I'm an avid surfer, and that kind of dictates everything that I do with my life. And bit by bit, just writing, creating, trying everything imaginable to make a living. Uh, I did freelance work. I designed really hideous looking websites for people. Uh, anything anybody would pay me for. Also as a byproduct of this, one of the things that happened was that I started uh, a project where I started interviewing people from different walks of life. Uh, it started out with bloggers who had somehow made their blog successful, and eventually it evolved into a show where now, uh, five years later, and 500 conversations later, I've talked to people who have robbed banks, I've talked to happiness researchers, I've talked to best-selling authors, I've talked to educators, and amazingly enough, I've gotten more of an education from doing that than I ever did in graduate school, and than I ever did as an undergrad, because I've been able to talk to people who've actually done things and built things and made things. And fast forward to May of last year, uh, suddenly, after such a long time of trying a lot of things that didn't work and just sticking with this project with the belief that something will come from all of this, I started publishing these very sort of lengthy Facebook status updates because I had pretty much exhausted uh, all of my various career options. I thought, all right, at this point, there's nothing left for me to do but tell the truth, which that ended up becoming what most of you know as the art of being unmistakable. And all of a sudden, I hit momentum like I had never hit before. So I took this book, uh, mainly because I couldn't get a book deal. Nobody was going to pick me. Despite all the things I had done, I had no publisher, no agent. I thought, okay, well, we can self-publish nowadays. So I hired a friend to design the book cover. I hired an editor, and we put it up on Amazon. I told 25 people about it that we knew. I mean, luckily, we had a big enough audience at that point that there were people that we could tell. And that book sort of became the turning point of this journey that had no, that seemingly had no end to it. The book ended up in the hands of Glenn Beck of all people, who I have absolutely nothing in common with, uh, considering I went to Berkeley, and if you know anything about Glenn, you get that there's really nothing in common. And I, I didn't even know who he was up until that point. Somebody sent me a note on Twitter saying, hey, the reason I think your book has you know, gone up so high in the rankings is because Glenn Beck raved about it on his show today. And I replied back, I was like, he's kind of a big deal, right? <laughs> so I went and Googled him. I thought, oh, okay, I should go check the Amazon numbers. And you know, in the span of about a month and a half, the book ended up uh, selling thousands of copies, ended up on the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. 
in addition to that happening, at the same time, uh, we really started to take this whole thing and turn it into a business. <coughs> we basically rebranded the show, uh, called it The Unmistakable Creative. We renamed our company Unmistakable Media. I had an advisor and a mentor who came on board, one of the people who I interviewed, who effectively helped me take what was a struggling idea from $600 in the bank to an event that was completely sold out, the book hitting the bestseller list, and about $100,000 in the bank in six months. All because somebody knew how to guide this process along. And by the end of April of this year, we had our first conference. Uh, today, the show reaches thousands of people around the world. And the funny thing is that this is all really just beginning. And I'm 36 years old and I've spent five years working on this project. And I thought a lot about what it is I wanted to spend uh, the remainder of the time talking to you about today. And what I learned from this journey, and the larger part of it really is, is what I wish people had taught me in school and what I wish I had learned long before I was 36 years old. Because as I said, I think that you guys have such an ability to influence and shape the future, and you have an ability to do it for people at an age where it's, it's really, really powerful. John, can you go to the next slide? So, you know, I talked about this idea that there's more than a handful of colors to paint with. And yet, you know, I think about the idea of a cluttered canvas that most of us are presented with. When we get into school, we're handed a set of options. Nobody ever asks us, well, what do you want to do? Or how would you make this? Or how would you paint this masterpiece? And that's surprising to me, given that when we're this young or when we're kids, we have no preconceived notions of what's possible. We, we live in this world of infinite possibility and then people come along and they shut off all these possibilities. And not necessarily intentionally or with bad intentions. You know, I, I look at the way my parents raised me and at times I thought, you know, you guys shut off possibilities. And then I realized, well, in the culture that they grew up in, there, weren't, there were no options other than just complete failure and poverty or making it. There's no in between. Uh, when you grew up the way that they did. But that's not the way we're growing up today. And I think that we have to expose kids to this idea that there's multiple colors to paint with. You know, people ask me, what do you do for a living? And that is the strangest question to answer to me because it comes out different every single time. But the one common theme I can say is that I made up a job because I couldn't find a real one. And yet, so many people are doing that in the world today. You watch kids who come out of college or kids who skip college completely, and they create careers where careers didn't exist, and they create something from nothing on a fairly consistent basis. You know, this is something, unfortunately, that gets trained out of us as we get older. You know, as I said, I, I grew up in a culture where straight A's were expected. And if you got a B, it was a disaster. That's great for passing tests. It's really lousy for making progress uh, in life. And you know, there's a psychologist at, at Stanford named Carol Dweck, some of you may be familiar with her research, and she talks about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. And when we measure people through grades and these just arbitrary metrics, uh, which work for a certain subset of people, we convince them that they're not smart when they might be in other ways. My sister graduated from Berkeley with a 3.7. I 
I graduated from Berkeley with a 2.9. I walked out of Berkeley believing that I had no talents, that I was destined never to do anything particularly great, and that my sister was the smart one because she became a doctor. And in a million years, I could have never predicted that I would write a book, that I would start a show, that I would do all of this stuff. And yet, it's taken insane amounts of failure and developing a capacity for failure that I actually lost along the way <coughs> because I had a very set idea of what success was supposed to look like. To me, success was super high grades from a top-notch school, a prestigious degree, all the accolades on paper that we've traditionally associated with success. And when they didn't work, I thought, okay, I have failed. And I see this over and over again, and it's such a tragedy because you get these really, really smart people, and somehow, because they have been indoctrinated into a system that has taught them that it's not okay to fail, they're basically running an uphill battle, trying to succeed in a system where they'll never actually succeed because the system itself is flawed for the way that they learn and the way that they're capable of succeeding in the world. So as you, as you think about you know, how you educate kids and how you talk to them about all of this, I really encourage you to teach them that it's actually okay not to be right. Uh, I've learned far more from being wrong and far more from failing than I ever did from success. I can't remember who it was. Somebody told me the other day that success is really easy. It's your failures that actually end up teaching you so much more. John? So this is another thing that I think has gotten lost. Uh, and I think you know, one of the things that's exciting to, to be here for me is that I know John believes in this wholeheartedly. And I think it's really cool that you guys have embraced this. I look at students now, especially ones that come out of college and grad school, and I look at the way the world works, and I look at the, the future, and I look at the economy, and what I'm seeing is that the people who get rewarded are the ones who are continually building things with their own two hands. The people who are making something from nothing. And yet, I was never taught that in school. I can't look back and tell you one time where I took something from nothing and worked on it for an extended period of time, say a year or two, where the goal wasn't to learn something and regurgitate it back and get a grade, but to actually start something and to finish it and to have a final byproduct, whether it be a book, whether it be a Lego castle. And you know, it's interesting, I talked to two medical doctors a few weeks ago, and they said that this idea of building stuff with your own two hands, not only is it good for us from a learning perspective, but it's led to decreases in anxiety and depression and increased happiness for the people who do it. So I wouldn't encourage you just to have your kids to do it, but for you to pick some sort of project that you can do where you get to make something with your own two hands. And I'll share one in particular with you that I had a lot of fun with last year. I <clears throat> spoke with somebody who had taught me a, a bit about accelerated learning. He wrote a book called The First 20 Hours, which was all about rapid skill acquisition on the, on the theory that you could become proficient at any skill in 20 hours. So the skill I decided to tackle was drawing, and I can't draw at all to this day. But I picked up a book called Teach Yourself to Draw in 30 Days and started drawing stick figures. And anytime somebody would ask me about my progress, I would say, you know, last week I was drawing like a kindergartner, this week I draw like a first grader. I don't think I ever made it past the first grade level. In fact, I'm sure there's stuff that's in your hallways that's far more beautiful than anything I ever made. And what's interesting is that drawing project actually had a significant influence on the work that I did going forward. If you look at uh, the unmistakableCreative.com website, 
if you look at you know the book covers that we do, even though I never created any of that stuff myself, it gave me a whole other appreciation for artists and working with art that I never would have had had I not just decided to go and do this project. And now it's a fundamental part of everything we do. We look at every single thing we create through the lens of cartoons, through the lens of art, and we say, you know, how can we make this more interesting? How can we make it unmistakable? And all because I was just you know, curious, I wanted to make something with my own two hands. And the other thing that's really, really special about making something with your own two hands is that you build something that nobody can ever take away from you. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, I've been fired from damn near every job I've been at, and I don't really have anything to show for the time that I've spent in any of those places. I have a really overpriced piece of paper that hangs on the wall at my parents' house for the time that I was at Berkeley and the time that I was at Pepperdine. But I look at everything that I've built, and no matter what happens, I'll always have that. And there's something really special about that. And it's something that I think needs to be a fundamental part of education. I think it's something that needs to be just ingrained into who we are because I think it's so important for our future. John. So I talked to you about the drawing project. You know, people have always asked me what it is that keeps me doing this work, what it is that uh, enables me to pick the total weirdos that I picked to interview. Uh, people are like, why do you find people who rob banks? And what makes you think people from prison or happiness researchers or you know, the strangest people you could find? I mean, a guy who walked a dog across America, for example. Uh, you know, I'm going to be talking to a guy soon who rode his bike from Berlin to India. And when I look at what the common thread between all of this stuff is it's curiosity. Something about every person that I talk to and every project that I attempt is driven by what I'm curious about. Could I make this work? Can somebody like me who loses cell phones every couple of weeks pull off a 60 person event uh, with nine speakers, which my best friend still finds shocking? Can somebody like me, who doesn't know the first thing about journalism and has never been a journalist, build a show where I interview people and share it with the world? And again, this is another one of those things that gets trained out of us. As we get older, we become conformist. We do what we're expected to do. Uh, we do everything that we're told. And we don't really question why, we don't really look at it in depth. And yet, what I find fairly consistently uh, as I talk to the people that I speak to, uh, as I come across really fascinating work, when I look at entrepreneurs who do fascinating things in the world, this seems to be a consistent theme, is that they just embrace curiosity. And I look at kids and I think that they have an opportunity that many of us don't as adults because they have no consequences to their risk necessarily. All the consequences to their risk are, are fairly made up. It's like, all right, if you screw this up, it's not like you're not gonna get dinner tonight. Uh, it's not like you're not gonna have a roof over your head. And that's a really special time and a special place to be. And it's something that I feel if we take advantage of, the results are gonna be spectacular. We're gonna see outcomes that probably right now you can't even predict. Uh, the ripple effect of the work that you guys do, one you may never see in your lifetime, but believe me, it's going to happen. And I wonder at times why nobody ever asked me what I was curious about when I was in school. There's a really great movie, 
uh, called Accepted. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Uh, where the guy basically doesn't get into college, so he makes up a college, and somehow the whole thing just gets out of hand, and hundreds of people show up at the college and actually pay tuition, and he doesn't know what to do. So somebody says, well, why don't you ask them what they want to learn about? He said, so we'll take the majority of their funds and appropriate those funds to whatever they want to learn about. And of course, you know, people come up with all sorts of crazy ideas, and every time I watch that, I keep asking myself, why hasn't an educational institution had the guts to try that and see what happens? I mean, what are the consequences going to be? They could be spectacular. And so one of the things that I would encourage each of you to consider, uh, and I'd love to see happen as a byproduct, if there's anything that I could see happen as a byproduct of my time here, this would probably be my idea of success uh, with you guys today is take one of your kids, take a couple of them, ask them what they're curious about, and let them spend an entire year just working on that. And see where it goes. You know? And don't put pressure on them to do this for a grade. Teach them to build something. Teach them to take something from start to finish and to work on it over an extended period of time in which they have to wait for the reward and they have to let the process of creating something itself become the reward. I really wish somebody had taught me that. It's something that I never learned and because of that, every time I went into a job, all I could think about was getting ahead. And even this year with the success of this book, it was a lesson I learned the hard way because I thought that's it, we've made it. And I ran into challenges almost immediately after because I didn't realize that this is an ongoing process throughout my life. You know, I thought about what it is that I wanted to leave you here with. Uh, they say when you prepare to talk to people, Try to boil it down to one thing that you want them to take away. And you know, given the life that I've experienced and, and the challenges I've had uh, with education and seeing how things turned out uh, and seeing the fact that everything I thought was going to work didn't, what I would ask of you more than anything is to not prepare your students